In this episode, you'll learn why service design can't live without digitalization and digital can't live without service design. We'll also learn how to move from customer journeys and service blueprints into something that actually triggers action. And finally, you'll also learn how practicing nonlinear decision making makes it possible to move from incremental to radical change. All that is coming up in this episode with these two guests. Hi, I'm Christina. Hi, I'm Lisa. And this is the Service, Service Design, Design Show. Show. Hi guys, my name is Mark Fontaine and this is the Service Design Show. The show where you get to learn what some of the world's best service designers are currently thinking about. So you can use that knowledge to transform services and businesses all around the world to become more human-centered and eventually more successful. We bring you a new episode every two weeks on Thursday. So if you don't want to miss anything, be sure to subscribe to the channel. My guests in this episode are Christina Karlander and Lisa Lindstrom. Lisa founded and manages the design agency called Doberman, where Christina is currently a service designer. In the next 30 minutes or so, Christina and Lisa will be talking about three topics. Service design and digitalization, how to create an actionable strategy, and finally, non-linear decision-making and radical change. If you want to fast forward to one of these topics, check out the episode guide down below in the description or just stick around and enjoy the whole episode. So let's jump right in. Welcome to the show, uh, Lisa and Christina. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi. Awesome to have uh, two women uh, on the show again. And um, I'm, you, you have a, both have a long history uh, within service design and I'm really curious where did it all start for you? So what is the first encounter with service design you had? For me, it was uh, back when I was studying cognitive science. Uh, I think it was 2003 or so, where I first heard, it, heard the term service design. And then it felt kind of obvious that, of course, everyone is thinking about all the touch points and how everything connects. Uh, but then I started in digital as an interaction designer and I realized, no, that's not the case at all. Uh, and then it's been kind of a, a long road to, to go back to that, actually. And I think for me, I was not as early. Uh, for me, it was more of, uh, I think in 2008, uh, somewhere around or 2007 or something around there where people started to talk about it and I was starting to reflect, is, is this something new? And for me, it was more a name of something we already did, mm -hmm. but I had no idea that there was a term. Mm -hmm. uh, so it kind of was both uh, framing something we already did, a movement that was requested from our customers, yeah. uh, but also it got me curious, ah, is this a profession or, mm -hmm. you know, or a movement, or what, what is it? And what is it? What did you find in the last uh, eight years? That, does something exist like service design? I would say for me, I think it could be different, but for me, it's, it's not a profession. For mm -hmm. me, it's a mindset. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really a, a way of viewing uh, how you work uh, more than like a specific category. But I think that also tells a lot about me because I don't think of about anything as a specific category. Mm -hmm. What is it for you? Um, for me, it's kind of, I think the service designers are a type of people though. Like we think in certain ways, um, but, uh, but also I think it's a natural thing. If you own a hotel, you also do service design without calling yourself a service yeah. designer. Yeah, and then we hear that a lot, you know, people are coming up to us and saying, oh, I didn't know it had a name what I'm doing. It, it happens so often, so uh, yeah. Um, let's dive into the three topics you shared with me. And um, <clears throat> you've got a bunch of question starters that I've sent you, and I've got the topics here. And I'll pick the first one, and it's up to you to go create the question that the other person will answer, right? Okay. <laughs> All right. So the first topic I have here is called digitalization and digital. Okay, and um, and I will take uh, this one, when will? When will? 
when will we stop talking about digitalization and see digital as something natural in services? And Go my ahead. Yeah. Is, uh, it's already happening, of course. <laughs> uh, digital is all over the place, and uh, we talk about digital, but maybe as at least when our clients approach us, we see that they talk about digital in silos, and then they have the rest of the organization. And they are not always kind of thinking of that they are having the same goals or doing the same things for the same customers, but rather seeing it as maybe complementing. Mm. We have an app that is complementing our service, or we have um, non-physical meetings, but they don't see that this is also something that kind of enhances the service, is the service. And we think that we need to talk more about ecosystems and how everything works together all the time. And uh, digital is the part of the future and it's going to be a very natural way of approaching a service and being the first touch point maybe. So uh, have, have you found a difference between clients that are starting from the digital side and then moving into service design compared to clients that are starting from the very physical services and then moving into digital? Is there a difference there? Uh, there might be a difference in how you think about your service and what your service is. Mm -hmm. And that you see that if your service started off as only represented in digital, then you might be might see that if you expand into the physical, you think of that differently. Mm -hmm. That if you start up a store, the store has a different purpose than it would have if you started up with a store and then added it up to it. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think also it's something around uh, if you are an old school company or if you're in a startup, and, and a lot of startups have you know, digital as something that is super natural uh, in their ecosystem. It's almost like um, service design becomes a little bit easier when you're coming from digital because you do not have to use it as uh, an argumentation tool. And I could sometimes see like in traditional company, it's used to find the right solution so that you can prove it. Mm -hmm. and whereas in maybe in a more digital company, I would the way that I would look at it is that it's more of a natural tool, natural way of looking at the world. So I think so, the way that we apply our tools are different, more of how old the company is. Mm -hmm. But what do you mean exactly with you need to prove it or? So, so it's okay. I, um, it's a little bit like if you if you were a traditional company and Christina would say, "I I have insights that customers think like this and that." Yeah, yeah. Uh, in the traditional company, they're going to ask her, "How many customers did you yeah. need to? Can you show me a customer journey?" And that customer journey needs to explain everything. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so it's proof uh, that. This is the direction where we go. Whereas I would sometimes see a, a little bit younger companies who could, I think, uh, listen to Christina earlier and yeah. start to prototype new services and start to apply the insights uh, earlier in the process. Okay. So let's move on to, uh, to your second topic. And it's called... Let me hold it up here. It's called actionable strategy. And do you have a question starter that goes along with this one? Of course we do. <laughs> uh, so uh, I think it's around uh, how can we make service design uh, to contribute to an actionable strategy? And then I'd say that it's about creating a story. Uh, having stories makes the, uh, the organization and everyone in an organization understand their part and what they're supposed to do. And we see that when we complement strategy with solutions and show like this is how your ordinary day is going to be from now on, then we can really see for each one who's going to provide that service that they understand what their part would be and what they need to train and what they need to change. Mm. To so, uh, is this is this topic born out of the sort of frustration that we often create a lot of plans and a lot of roadmaps and action plans, but there isn't a lot of action? Or I think I think that it's that frustration. I think all of us mm -hmm. have made brilliant concepts yeah. uh, and brilliant strategies, but then we don't see the end customer 
to meet these new ways of of, of uh, delivering a service or a product. Yeah. Uh, I think it's that, but it's also something around speed. Uh, one of our frustrations is that uh, we don't see organizations being able to act as fast as they can mm. because it's still like management lingo instead of being like actionable lingo. Mm. So how can you how can you make everyone in an organization get what is it that is requested by me? Mm. And and the way to do that is to make sure that it's described in a language that everyone understands. And that language are stories. The language is stories and also it's visualizations. Oh. Yes. Not only the models and the people, but also see what, what do we put in people's hands? Yeah. What are they experience and how does it look? Mm. Because that also gives new images to people. Yeah, at least it's not uh, PowerPoint charts or Excel sheets or documents or, yeah. And also it's not the service blueprint itself yeah. because the service blueprint contains everything. And then it's it's easy to get lost. Yeah, well, you you start to become a manager, and you start to become you start managing stuff again instead of creating action, yeah. creating movement, right? Yeah. yeah, and I think one of the reasons why we as designers are you know asked to do these important things is because we can be concrete, mm. <laughs> we can visualize things, we can make them into something. Mm. Uh, that is easy for a lot of people to understand. So we also need to think of it uh, as tools for internal buy-in or internal comprehensiveness or something yeah. like that. Do not only design uh, the touch point itself, but also the activation of for people internally to, to get it. Mm -hmm. Have you seen... Um, uh, Sometimes I've seen in our project that it sort of backfires that we're really good at uh, making things tangible. And then, for instance, you present a prototype and then people start to react on the prototype and they forget to see the strategy behind it. It's a, uh, it's a real complex thing to kind of test an idea rather than usability when you start showing prototypes. Yeah. And I think we struggle a lot with that. Um, but we usually, when we put it in a, in a, in a storytelling film or, or whatever it is, we try to not make it super detailed, mm -hmm. but having it kind of plain. That there will be some sort of button here that says <laughs> something, but maybe not the whole context. Because that evokes that, oh, this is done, now I can give feedback on the interface, not the idea. And but I think this also goes along with that we, as service designer, cannot go into an organization and just play one part. Uh, so we also need to train the whole organization to understand what is a prototype mm. or, you know, what is this supposed to mean to me? And that is not only done through this scenario or story, it, it has to be like several things that you do within or in an organization to kind of uh, avoid uh, the behavior that you were describing. Mm -hmm. um, what are the, um, what, when we look at uh, an actionable strategy, where do you get your inspiration from to actually make uh, strategy actionable? So what, what are, yeah, what, what is your source of inspiration? I think I think I think one of the things is that because we are creative people, uh, we we get inspiration from all over. So I don't think that we can say like from one part or the other. Uh, it, it's really about continue to be open and playful uh, uh, to try different things, and then we try to tell each other. Like I get super inspired when I hear someone here who tried something mm -hmm. and, and this action really worked or I tried this thing and it did not really work at all. Mm -hmm. um, so through being open and sharing a lot, I guess. Yeah. All right. And, and also I think from the people we meet, because whenever you meet a user or an end customer, it's always that inspiration also that you see, okay, how can I, visualize how to change only this behavior a bit. Mm. But uh, the, and yeah, the, the question uh, also comes, you know, it's, it's not by reading management books probably, right? No. It's, it's through other means that we find ways to make, to do the work we do, right? 
I very often say that the society that we live in today that I call the prototyping society, there is no management book. <laughs> the only way to find out is to explore ourselves. Yeah. And I also tell this to management teams, yeah. like, I'm sorry, I cannot give you the handout. Uh, the only thing we can do is through trying different ways and see what works and remember what did work and then continue to improve. Mm. That's the only thing. Mm. Whereas in the linear, like what I call the delivery society, that that's where people have been training and we already know all these books. Mm. Uh, so um, the inspiration needs to come from all over in, and from within. Uh, to find out how to do this. So, okay, you're already hinting up on the third topic. So let's just uh, let's let's just make it happen. And the third topic is I don't think we've had this one on the show yet. It's called nonlinear decision making. And is there a question starter? And of course there is. Of yeah. course there is. Um, when will nonlinear decision making take over from linear? So yeah, f oh. first of all, uh, explain the difference for you. So in a linear decision making, uh, you know, we it's a hierarchy. Uh, so, so you know, uh, you take the most difficult decisions on the top, like on the board and in the executive team, and then the, the lighter decision would go down to the people who knows the customer. Mm. Whereas I would love to, and, and you also measure things, and you have like systems and policies that are very uh, structured this way and this way. Whereas I say the nonlinear way of working and decision making in the nonlinear way is a super creative way of looking at your organization. Uh, so first of all, I think it, it demands you to be musical when a decision needs to be on the board and when a decision needs to be closer to the customer. And, and you cannot uh, put that in a policy. I think that that is something for the organization to be more fluent or musical about. Um, and the other thing is to understand that when you evolve or develop an organization, it needs to uh, allow that you do different ways of making decisions. So one way could be at this time, well, let's do a discovery or a pre-study. This time, let's just try it. This time, let's have a six months project. This one, two days. And, and to have that flexibility, for me, is a non-linear way of running your organization. Christina, anything you want to add? Um, also, I think it's about not having, in timing as well, not having the, like, the big decisions first and then make them smaller, but be able to have also a thinking that, okay, we can think in, in parallel both strategy and detail in the beginning and in the end. Yeah. So, so I look at it as, for example, the way that I run Doberman is, is really inspired by this. Uh, so I'm thinking like, okay, if we have 100 people who work here who are all super smart and experts, I better that, you know, how can I get the most use of them? So nonlinear decision making for me could sometimes be that I delegate to everyone to take a decision. And sometimes it is, no, these three people. Sometimes it's me. And, and for me, that is not structured in this kind of hierarchical way. It's more uh, creative and the way that maybe we work with users. And, and <clears throat> the big question, of course, is how do you take traditional companies along this way of thinking and along this way of working? I train them. So uh, whenever we work with someone and, and kind of help them to find out, you know, how do we innovate a new offering for you? We always suggest that we also train uh, the management to understand these new things. So instead of, instead of a business plan, I'd like to see a prototype. But then we need to see, have an executive team that understands that a prototype, mm -hmm. it's not for you to say yes or no, it's for you to give feedback for an iteration. Uh, so we take management teams on, on kind of service design journeys where they hands-on uh, through experience-based training basically do, uh, do an innovation journey and then reflect what type leadership do I need to do more of to develop more of this. 
uh, and and we do and we, it's been super fun and very very interesting to see how fast they actually can change. And and I think this is really uh, essential because if we don't do if we don't help them to learn this vocabulary, they won't be able to judge the value of the work people do, right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And then we won't see uh, the change that we want to see. And I, I think it was something that you said, uh, Christina, on storytelling and being visual. Uh, so a couple of weeks ago, I worked with an executive team, and I think that they are pretty advanced now. So I asked them the question, between you and your vision to be super custom centric, uh, what are the barriers? And I asked them to write the barriers on boxes and then build a wall, <laughs> you know, between them <laughs> and their vision. So they saw it visually in the room, like, wow, this is this is what's between us and, and, and our vision. And then I asked them, what how can you take each box and through your leadership see if you can lower these barriers and make you more customer centric? So then for me that's kind of you know using all the tools that we have are in our toolbox to also help them accelerate to become more customer centric. Christina, again, anything to add? <laughs> <laughs> and for me, it's also, I think, nonlinear, it, it also sounds fun. And I think that leaders want that. Yeah. Because, it also uh, sounds scary. It sounds scary, but it sounds modern and sounds creative. And I think that's also an argument of, okay, if, I'm a big, if I have a big organization and uh, we need to modernize, it's not only through digital and our touch points, but also how we are yeah. and how we present. Yeah. And if we start thinking, oh, non-linear, okay, that's a, also a very good argument. Then, mm. uh, yeah, I want to be mm. there. Yeah, but I, but I think if you say some scary, the reason why I think we can do this right now is because it's super scary to be a traditional corporate company because the world is changing so fast. So, you know, what's the most scary thing? To stand still and be traditional or to adopt into a world that is, is new to you and sounds, you know, mm. maybe mm. unfamiliar in the language, but is maybe your solution to become uh, a more fast-moving, agile yeah. organization. So we as service designers are in a good place right now, right? The, the, the pressure yes. is building and... People are just uh, yeah, uh, in the position where they have to try different things, right? Definitely. <clears throat> Definitely. So, um, we're heading toward the, end of the, toward the end of the show and I always have a final question and that is, uh, this is your opportunity to ask the viewers a question. So is there anything you'd like to ask? For the service design community? Yeah. Is there anything on your mind, a question that you would like to share with, uh, with the community? Uh, okay, I have one question. Why don't you start more companies? I think that service designers are, would be brilliant uh, in being entrepreneurs. And I currently see a lot of service designers as, you know, in being consultants. And a lot of service designers who work in big, you know, corporate companies doing fantastic work. But I'd like to see a few more service designers uh, who start their own companies. Okay, that's one. For me, I think I'm more in the, um, if that's kind of from, from the <laughs> yeah. other, ang other angle, I'd say as a service designer, I think what I struggle with right now is to see how much, how do we expand our minds to be able to grasp everything? Because service design tends to always be everything. It's all perspectives, so many target groups, and see kind of what methods do we need to absorb that mass? Because also the tech is coming <laughs> <laughs> like, a, like a storm. Uh, and we need to be able to have, have that minds that's very open all the time through that new at some point will explode <laughs> hopefully not all right so why don't we start more companies and how do we cope with all the things a service designer needs to understand know learn about right yeah all right well we'll see how people if people react in the comments um, so that's all the time we've got uh, for this episode. Thank you, 
Thank you for your time and I'm uh, very happy to, to do a two-person interview again. Okay, thank you thank so you. much. Bye-bye. So what are your thoughts about the questions Lisa and Christina just asked? Let us know down below in the comments. This show is all about helping you to become a better service designer by sharing real life stories of people that are currently shaping the field. If this is your first time here and you'd like to see more interviews with service design pioneers, be sure to check out some of the past episodes and don't forget to subscribe to the channel. For now, thanks for watching and I'll see you in two weeks time in a new episode.